Uh, welcome to our afternoon parallel session on investing in clean tech. Uh, my name is John Wyant. I'm the deputy director of the Precord Institute for Energy Efficiency, among other things. That means I do whatever Jim Sweeney or George Schultz or Bill Peary tell me to do, which is a pretty good job, actually. Um, in this panel uh, on uh, investing in clean tech, Jim, I, and Heather Richmond actually discussed this months ago about how to do it and so on. I had a lot of great ideas, most of which didn't work. So I'd like to first acknowledge Heather Richmond, who you just saw in action in the last section, for actually providing a lot of ideas that did work. Uh, Heather is the Senior Managing Director at SNR uh, Denton's Public Policy and Regulation Practice in Silicon Valley, although I think of her uh, as a freelance champion of clean tech that works across the public and private sector very skillfully. Heather, where are you? There she is. Uh, so we do, uh, thanks mostly to Heather, have an incredibly all-star cast, kind of a bunch of cleanup hitters on one podium, so I'll try to say as little as possible. Uh, I'd like to introduce them now and give a little bit of uh, background of the structure for the program. Uh, the goals are um, to uh, get out what's new in clean tech, we think. Maybe we're wrong, but you guys would know. Uh, there's a lot new in the last year in clean tech, number one. Number two, we were interested in how the different segments of the uh, clean tech financing business kind of related or didn't relate to each other. So we have the segments uh, all represented here on this panel, mostly. Uh, and then we were interested in the role of the public sector in either helping or hindering what you guys, what all you guys do. So for our all-star uh, cast, we're going to start with Larry Kelly who's a managing partner of private investment company Kelly Ventures, but also for this purpose co-chairs the Energy Clean Tech Special Interest Group for the Band of Angels. So he's going to define entrepreneurship and then talk about what the angel investment community looks for in this space. Uh, Dave Graham is going to describe his very interesting and innovative accelerator concept for digital clean tech uh, companies uh, using the model of his uh, Firm Green Start, which he started uh, up as an example, and then we're going to move back more towards the traditional, you know, tried and true veteran superstars of Silicon Valley, Josh Green for more, Dow, more David Al Ventures. I learned this morning that Josh is actually a mentor for some of the incubator, some of the uh, uh, accelerator uh, projects. So hopefully you guys can make that. Uh, transition more smoothly than I just did. And then finally, last but not least, the cleanup hitter, hitter of the cleanup hitters, uh, Trey Vassallo, a partner at Kleiner Perkins Caulfield, Caulfield and Byers. I like to put in Byers because uh, 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 Brooks' brother, Tom, is a, a, actually a faculty colleague of Jim Sweeney and myself. So we're really excited. I actually picked up from Trey's uh, Bio, she thrives at the intersection of great products and big markets, which sounds like a good theme. So we ought to try to get to that point, and I'd like to call on uh, uh, Larry to start us off down this train. So we're going to do uh, angel investing, accelerators, kind of early to mid-stage uh, conventional venture cap, and then later stage venture cap, although that may blend together a little bit. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so I have two confessions to make. One of them is nothing I have to say is original. I've stolen it from everybody else, and the, and the other is I cheated. Uh, I got. Uh, I'm, I'm the only one doing a presentation, and my colleagues aren't doing that. So, so I thought I'd start and talk a little bit about the band. The band is the oldest professionally organized angel investment group in the comp in the country. Uh, 19 years old. We uh, have about 140 members. Most of us are. Uh, have been operating executives either in large companies or in startups or in many cases, including my own and both. Uh, I started my first company when I was a sophomore in college and I've been involved in <clears throat> more than 20 startups actively uh, since then, uh, both on my own and inside larger companies, but mostly on my own. Um, the, uh, we look at about 800 deals a year and, and that would be, I think for more David Auer or Kleiner, that would be about the same hunt or maybe even a little bit more. We, uh, we uh, have 33 present to our greater audience. Uh, last year, we, of those 33, we funded 18, um, which is a high number for us. It was uh, maybe 11 the year before that. Of those 33, uh, uh, we invest in life sciences and in information technology and in energy and clean tech. Last year, of the 33 that presented, seven were in the energy and clean tech space. We would have funded all seven. We funded five. We lost one to uh, another uh, company, another firm, and then the seventh one, we haven't come to terms yet. We're still working with them. 
Uh, we invested in two water companies, two LED companies, uh, a, a solar thermal company, a transportation company, and uh, one more I can't remember. Our earliest, uh, one of our earliest investments uh, in 1998 was in MBA Polymers, which is now the world's largest recycler of durable plastics. And uh, it's a, about a $100 million company. We are hoping that they go public next year. We went through seven rounds with them. So we, we, you know, we call that uh, you know, uh, seven, seven easy rounds to an IPO. And, uh, and uh, um, so, uh, so I mentioned some of these statistics. I won't go. So a typical deal size for an angel is anywhere from uh, 300,000 to maybe a million and a half. Um, one of the things that separates angels from other, uh, from VC firms is that it's our own money. And as I said, we're all op we've all been operating executives, and so we're very, we're very picky, and we're very, we're very pre precise, and we're, we, we drill right in, right in and figure out what's going on in the company. Um, my own experience is that is that success comes often from being personally involved, uh, not necessarily in, in management, but I am oftentimes involved in uh, the active management of a company. But but as an active director or as, as a board observer, is, is helping the company succeed, and and I think that's one of the key differences about a, a, an organization like the band. Uh, we have a in our interest group of uh, in the energy and clean tech space. There are about 40 of us who. Uh, invest in companies in this space. Um, so follow up, these are VCs that we've worked with in the past. So typically, uh, you know, it's, it's your own money and then it's friends and family and fools and then it's angels and, and then it's VCs after that. And so these are some of the VC firms that we've worked with in the past. Uh, and then this is our, our deal uh, review process. As I said, we look at, you know, 60 to 100 deals a month. One of the things that's different is with us versus uh, uh, other firms or other organizations is that we have at least six experts in a given field look at any proposal that comes to us. Uh, and and in, the, in the energy space, um, I personally look at everyone and, and my co-chair and I try to meet with, every, we see 15 to 20 companies a month and we try to meet with every one of them and evaluate it personally. Um, so, uh, so that's a little bit about the Band of Angels. Now, I, now I, I volunteer to talk about entrepreneurship because my feeling is that 75 years ago, everybody in our country was an entrepreneur. And somehow, it's, you know, our society and our institutions and our, and our government are beating that out of us, you know. And, and you know, in France, 56% of the GDP is controlled by the, federal, by the governments, you know, and we're, we're, we're creeping up. And I'm, I'm concerned about that. So I want to talk about entrepreneurship a little bit. Um, uh, is this, is a, this, does anybody know who this is? Anybody, anybody recognize? Raise your hand if you recognize who this is. Ah, good, okay. This is one of my heroes. This guy is Oscar Pistorius. He's, um, he runs a quarter mile, which is a race that I used to run in college. I still run sometimes, but I'm not nearly as fast. Uh, he was born without legs, without the lower part of his legs. And you can see uh, that he has these blades on there. He runs for South Africa. He's about 25 or 26 years old. He runs a quarter mile. The Olympic qualifying trials for the quarter mile is, is 45.8 seconds. So he does better than that. Uh, and and uh, they, they don't want to, they wouldn't let him compete. They, they said that because he had these prostheses, he was not, not, uh, not going to be allowed. And he went to court and, and fought and, uh, and won. So he's uh, now going to have to try for the South African team. But but you know, maybe in three or four or five weeks when we see the Olympics, we'll see whether he, whether he made it. But, but this is the kind of guy that is a hero to me because he doesn't quit, he doesn't say no, he figures out what his passion is, and he's going for it. And he's, he's not gonna be denied. He is gonna, he's gonna do it, All right? So, so who knows what they think entrepreneurship is? So we, we have a, somebody wanna give a definition of entrepreneurship? Go ahead. That's cheating. Limited resources to create something that's powerful and great. Oh, great! That's really good. You're close, <laughs> right? So, so here's a here's a possible definition of entrepreneurship. It's a pursuit of an opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. Now we're all we're all going after opportunities. You know, that's what Darwin's all about, right? Uh, 
but, but the key phrase here is without regard to resources currently controlled, and you said limited resources. And, and so what an entrepreneur does is gets, gets resources committed to his or her project that, that, that you know, you don't get in a large corporation or in a government agency. You, in a large corporation or a governor, government agency, you sit around and you, you wait for budgets to be approved and you ask for somebody to sign a check. Entrepreneurs go out and make things happen, right? And they go out and they, you know, they borrow from their friends, they, they get the guy down the street, they get a former business contact to do something for them and they make things happen. So, so, so we look for that. That's one of the things we look for. Now, uh, what are the, um, what I would call the, uh, so someone comes in with a proposal, and I think Josh and Trey and, and Dave will look at this as, as sort of the same way, but you can, you could, when you're evaluating a business proposal, you might be able to, if you could, at a high level, condense, it, condense your analysis down to maybe 10 words. And all the words are monosyllabic, they're you know, gut English words, they're not Latin words, Latinate words with lots of syllables, and, and, and it's 10 words and it's three questions. And these are the three questions. Is it real? Can we win? And is it worth it? And again, this isn't mine. I, I got this from one of the original VCs in the Valley back in the 1970s. And so is, is it real is a vision question. Um, it's all about your vision and strategy. You know, does the product do, the product te technology do what it's said to do? Can you demonstrate that it really does what you say it's gonna do? Uh, do you have a working prototype? How far, do you have, are you in production? By the way, uh, of the 60 to 80 deals that we see each month, more than half are already in production, which really surprises me, uh, in production and in revenue, um, or eyeballs if it's a software product. Uh, the second is the customer. What, what kind of traction are you getting customer? Do you have evidence that customers are gonna change their behavior from what they were doing before? Because they are gonna have to make a change, and that's always, almost always the largest uh, problem. Uh, is getting them to change, and are they going to pay good money to buy your product or service? And then the last is, uh, is what we used to call at HP contribution, and, and what we often call now, what's the unique, unfair, sustainable advantage that you offer? Uh, and th so those are all the vision parts. And then the second one is, can we win? And this is all about execution. So, so how many people think entrepreneurs take risk? Raise your hand if you think entrepreneurs take risk. Okay, so I don't think so. I think what entrepreneurs do is they get other people to take risk and it's all in the execution. So if you go through execution, you know, it's can we craft the right message? Uh, can we get the customer to respond to the message? Can we build the product? Can we ship the product? Can we support the product after it's shipped? Can we, uh, can we price it correctly? Uh, can we manufacture it with high quality? All those things involve execution risk. Now there's vision risk and strategy risk as well. So what a good entrepreneur does is sees the opportunity before other people do, do, and then goes out and lays the risk off on other people, other parties. It's part of that getting things done without regard to resources currently controlled. Lays the risk off on other people. Then the last part is the uh, is it worth it question, and that's all about the return. The band's IRR, going back over 19 years, is 53%. Um, so the two functions. So in, in, in evaluating a company, when a team comes in now this is me, uh, the two things I look for in the team. Well, let me turn around the other way. What's the most important thing? What's the last thing a company wants to give up? Control. No, we got control, but I mean, if you had things, equ yeah, equity, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the most important thing a com company has is a customer, right? That's, that's the most important thing, right? So the two functions, and we're here in the Valley, we're doing technology stuff, so the two most important traits that we look for or functions are sales and product development. So um, if you haven't sold, <coughs> get somebody on your team who's, who's carried quota and managed salespeople. This is, this is really important. Uh, my friends who are deans at the Sloan School and the Harvard Business School and the Business School here and elsewhere, if you talk to them and you say, why, uh, why don't you have sales in the MBA curriculum? And they say, well, it's vocational. And, and, and that's a mistake. Sales, is, sales are really, really crucial to a startup company. So I would recommend that you get somebody with good sales skills on your team. Um, the last is um, <clears throat> the five traits. So, so 
How many in here are entrepreneurs? R raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur. Ah, great, okay, so we got, we got a good bunch. So these are the, it's almost always the CEO. Um, you can take a really great uh, idea and have a mediocre team and they'll screw it up. You can have a really great CEO and a really great team and a mediocre product and they'll, and they'll build a good business. So the things we look for in a CEO are ability, motivation, and character. Now those are Warren Buffett's, Buffett's favorite three. Uh, experience, uh, Dave helped me with that one. And, uh, and then resourcefulness, and that's, that goes back to uh, defining entrepreneurship. Thanks. Great, thanks Larry. <laughs> for a very uh, perspicacious introduction to this session, and now I'd like to call on Dave Graham for a great start. Okay, move the ball on down. down. You could sit there if you want, that's fine. All right, let's see if I, oh, I can do it here actually. Let's see if I can do it in three minutes or less, someone time me. Um, so Green Start, what we fundamentally believe is that the world's dependence on fossil fuel is the defining challenge of our generation. And so the best way to tackle it, we believe, is through innovation and with entrepreneurs. We also believe that starting companies is really hard. We don't just believe that, we know that firsthand. And so we're here to help, and we're here to help digital clean tech companies have a better shot at success. And what I mean by digital clean tech companies are companies that have business models that are primarily software based and either reduce the use of dirty energy or promote the use of clean energy. What we do and how we work with companies is really as follows. We're essentially a design studio combined with an accelerator. We believe that design and design thinking can give the company a competitive advantage. And what we do then is find these companies, invest seed capital, and then we bring them into our office. We bring them out to, to San Francisco for 12 weeks. And we work with them in four practice areas. First, customer development. Second, UX. Third, brand design. And then fourth, fundraising. It's really hard to get in. We receive hundreds upon hundreds of applications and do about 12 investments a year. We are really bullish on the, or in about with the clean tech space, but in particular digital clean tech. And we kind of break energy into two segments. One is energy 1.0, and the way we look at it is energy 1.0 was about energy generation. It is about the development, the creation of technologies such as solar, LED, wind. And we believe that the Energy 1.0 nut has been cracked. It's working. We see the technology working. We see the price points coming down. We see the efficiency curves going in the right direction. And so we're really excited about Energy 2.0. And how we look at Energy 2.0 is as we look at it as being smart energy and making energy smart. The internet enabled us to move bits and bytes around. And we think that Energy 2.0 is about moving electrons around. It's about using software to make energy more efficient, more storable, more usable. We are really seeing some interesting companies come out of this space, look no further than Nest, uh, Opower, a couple of uh, Kleiner companies. We've got some really good companies, Scoot, uh, RidePal, Growing Energy Labs, Kilowatt Hours, that we're really excited about. They can make money um, and will make money but their business models actually enable the world to change. And, and those are things that we really like about what is happening in this digital clean tech space. And so I'll close with what we're looking for and the help that we need. We need help in three areas, really. One is with mentorship. And what I mean by that is that we need guys like, like Larry, like Josh. Uh, Josh is actually a, a mentor at Green Start that can sit down and work with entrepreneurs to help them avoid the pitfalls that if you've been an entrepreneur, you most likely fell into. We need not only to bridge that knowledge gap, but to bridge that funding gap. And so we need more people like Trey and, and Josh and, and, and Larry at the band that really are willing to put money into to clean tech and the digital clean tech space because we need to be able to attract the right entrepreneurs into this space. And it really ends up being all about the entrepreneur. And so the third thing is just that, entrepreneurs. 
we need to really create a movement, uh, inspire, if you will, educate these, our current group, this current generation of entrepreneurs that if they want to make a boatload of money, they have to solve a big problem. And there is no bigger problem out there than the world's dependence on energy uh, or dirty energy. And so inspiring them to, instead of perhaps starting the next Facebook, to start the next Airbnb or the next Zipcar or the next Relay Rides because those companies are making money, but the difference being is that they're changing the world. And so that's what we're looking for and that's why we're here to help. Thanks very much, Dave. Next, to carry the uh, ball further down the field, I'd like to call on Josh Green for more David Owl Ventures. Josh. Thanks. Thanks very much, John. Um, more David Owl is a, a traditional venture capital firm. We're currently in our ninth fund. It's a $700 million vehicle. Uh, we've been around for 28 years, and we're investing in IT, life sciences, and clean technology. Now, clean technology is a uh, relatively recent uh, category for us and frankly for everybody and uh, I'm going to provide you some observations at least from the from the venture capital perspective as to what that category looks like. Um, it is following the classic uh, Gartner hype cycle um, and the era for those of you who know that cycle it is the era of irrational exuberance is over. We are now firmly in the valley of despair um, and slowly climbing our way out of that. Now what's interesting is, is that there are investment opportunities at every one of these spots on the cycle. This is not to leave you with, a, with a, a, an awful terrible message about the future of clean tech. In fact, just the opposite. Um, you need to go through these elements of an investment cycle in order to get to ultimately uh, something that's really valuable and, and long term and the rest. Now those oscillations tend to be much more severe in nascent uh, investment value chains and clean tech is one of those early investment uh, value chains that's early in its history. And so as a result, um, it's not surprising to see us uh, where we are right now. Um, a venture capitalist was recently asked, uh, tell me about all the clean tech success stories and, and on a panel and he provided a blank stare in answer to that question. And, you know, my answer to it, if I had sat up there, would have been to say, the categories existed for only about seven years. The average startup that's venture capital back today is nine years to liquidity. So everything you hear about the classical three to five years and all the rest of it, the facts are it's nine years to liquidity. So what do you want from clean tech? Do you want it to be two years early on what the average is? So everything's doing just fine. We do have uh, our failures and we will continue to have failures and that is a necessary and important actually part of the entire process of investing and, and will, it's inherent in venture capital in and of itself. Um, so the question becomes, uh, given that current status on a macro level, where are we looking at investments today? We're looking um, much more towards the nexus of clean tech and IT, right where Green Start uh, has planted itself. And I think these guys are doing a terrific job, and I'll make another comment about that in just a moment, about how venture capital works with uh, 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 an entity like Green Start uh, in looking at investments. But basically, it's that nexus of IT and clean tech. And that takes two forms. It takes one, uh, a company that's doing great like Opower, um, that's a classical IT company that's planted in the clean technology space. And the other are what I would call applied technologies, companies that look very much like classical uh, Silicon Valley technology companies, hardware-based typically, uh, and the like. We're investors in a company called Cicado, which is a LED module, um, reasonably low capital requirements, uh, in revenue, they ship 600,000 LED mod modules using remote phosphors to create really high quality light. That is very much like uh, classical startups in the, uh, in the 1980s sense of the word uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, so, what does the ecosystem look like today? Uh, strategics, 
uh, and large corporations are more important than they've ever been. Um, understanding their agendas uh, is absolutely a critical insight for us to not only understand where uh, new market entrants and small companies can uh, make a stake, but also uh, create accessibility to these markets. These markets look extremely tantalizing um, because they're tremendous, they're huge, they're multi, multi tens of billions of dollars. Um, but the key question that we look at is accessibility for a startup and how can they, how can they succeed in that environment. The other is the other side of the equation, which is Green Start. And uh, accelerators, well, there aren't really too many folks like you, um, but, uh, but basically uh, uh, I would like to suggest that it's the separating the wheat from the chaff uh, and providing us a leg up uh, in, uh, in areas where we don't really have the resources to do what they're doing. And so working closely with folks like that is very important. I want to end on, a, um, on one other note, which is policy. Um, the classical Silicon Valley formulation is to Heisman pose uh, all government, okay? Uh, and that has certainly been the case in IT investing. Uh, it has not been the case in life sciences, and it, it can't be. And I would suggest even less so can it be in, uh, in energy. In other words, it's an absolute must uh, to be working hand in hand with policy matters. And to be frank about it, I'm really tired of playing defense um, for the last year or two on clean tech policy. Um, I'm actually the incoming chairman of the National Venture Capital Association, and we have uh, worked up a, a bill uh, called an Energy Innovation Tax Credit. Uh, now, lo this looks at energy generation, uh, and a lot of our portfolio, existing portfolio, is in energy generation. But what it says is, government doesn't pick any winners. This is, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but the energy industry as a whole spends four-tenths of 1% of their revenues on R&D, okay? Absolutely remarkable. Um, lowest of any meaningful industry in the United States um, by a long shot. So this is to encourage more R&D, both by startups and by big companies. And the concept would be you get a tax credit for doing so and therefore an incentive until so many electrons have been produced by that commercialized technology or uh, until so many gallons have been produced uh, and the like, and then it would tra trail off. And it doesn't, and, and frankly, it is independent of the issue of fossil and, or renewables. And the reason for that is, is that uh, we actually have bipartisan and bicameral support uh, for this bill, which is in, just in the drafting stages. But it allows us an opportunity to now go on offense uh, again. I don't know if you saw this, but the final epitaph for the Solyndra situation was written yesterday. That is now officially off of Congress's agenda. So uh, thank goodness. <laughs> and, uh, and now we can uh, hopefully move, uh, move forward. Great. Thanks very much, Josh. Yeah. OK, Trey, so now we have the bases loaded with three speed demons on the backs, but no pressure at all. Yeah, no, I actually no. forgot to mention uh, Trey has three degrees from Stanford, which is a lot better than my three degrees uh, from You stole my Berkeley. lead, I was going to say. So I, I use every excuse to get back on campus, because I clearly <laughs> spent a lot of years here. So Excellent. Great. Um, so I've been at Kleiner for about eight years and uh, was fortunate to be part of the founding team of our green tech strategy. Um, we've been around for 40 years. Uh, like Josh's team, we've historically invested in life science, information technology, and, and now we have a burgeoning green tech practice. Uh, we, in the process of doing that, just discovered um, what we thought to be an amazing opportunity in front of us. And so we also added um, a, a growth uh, portfolio in addition to our main fund, which is a billion dollar fund focusing on scaling up green technology. So uh, you can think of Kleiner as um, almost stage agnostic. Historically, we've been very early stage, so we will seed companies, not as much as these guys do, so we're excited about Green Start. Um, we typically do A's and B's, and now we'll do growth investments as well. Um, our green tech portfolio is well underway. Um, we have over 60 companies to date in this portfolio, very broad 
from energy um, to sort of my sector where I spend most of my time, which is really in what I've been calling digital energy. So um, I'm an IT person at heart. We're in the middle of Silicon Valley. So my passion is really taking this great information technology and using that to change the way we interact with our environment. Um, another theme that I often talk about is, now that we have everyone online, let's get everything online. And once we have everything online, it totally changes the dynamic. Um, and so how that has, uh, I, I guess, guided my investment philosophy, um, you know, I have four companies that I tend to talk about um, in green tech, uh, which are Opower, uh, which has already been alluded to. This is a, a really exciting software company. Who knew that social benchmarking and customer engagement for utilities actually was a good thing? You know, it, this is, it's, it's a very basic notion, but they have started this wonderful idea, and now they're essentially customer engagement for utilities. And as energy gets more complex, and as customers demand more control of their energy, this is an absolute must-have trend. Um, that gave us some insight, um, as well as sort of my, my um, desire for finding you know, ways to bring the rest of our environment online. Um, Nest was an opportunity that for us was uh, a really, really exciting one. Um, the, you know, just quickly, I had been looking at you know, a lot of initiatives to drive efficiency in the home because I'm a big believer at disruption at the edges. You know, you're not going to be able to disrupt through a utility like you can through the customer. The problem, however, was that all the products out there for customers sucked. They're crappy. Um, no one actually wants them. Maybe the utility wants you to use them, but I certainly don't want them in my home. And so how can we get great teams who really understand great product design to design something that a consumer actually wants? Um, and in the process of building something a consumer wants, it also does great for society. Um, and so for me, that embodiment is Nest. This is a, a team of folks from Apple who said, uh, you know, we're going to take uh, a detour for a while and we're going to go reinvent consumer products. And they reinvented the thermostat. Um, and so uh, that, that's a whole other thing we can talk about, maybe more of that theme later. Um, another company in my portfolio, in fact, one of the guys that's here and on panel next is Enlighted. And for me, Enlighted is the nest concept, but for commercial buildings. Take the low-hanging fruit in commercial buildings, lighting, make it a very smart distributed system, and use that to bring our buildings online. Um, and, uh, and then the last company is Recycle Bank, which is really incentives and rewards for getting consumers aligned with doing the right thing uh, for society. So, so that's sort of a smattering of the area I'm spending my time. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, um, uh, I'm looking for anything, again, really in this theme around how can I bring the rest of the world online and using mobile. Um, you know, we've got mobile taking off everywhere else. It's now our interface to the world. So how can we take some of this great thinking that's going on in green and really make it more mobile and more with people on a daily basis? So um, anyway, I will stop there and uh, let us get into the, the questions. Good day. Okay, thanks very much, Ray. So since we're almost right on schedule, finally, uh, do you guys have any questions for each other, or you're all talked out? Do you want to go straight to the audience? It's up to you. Whatever you want. It's your call. Uh, let's go to the audience. To ask, yeah. Well, maybe you can interface with each other during the responses to the questions. Uh -huh. Okay, let's go for questions then. I hope people have some queued up. We have one way in the back there, one up here. Uh, yeah, my question, Tom Faust, uh, my question is for Josh Green. Uh, you say you're, you're working on a, introducing a bill that would <clears throat> have tax incentives for, for new manufacturing plants. Is, is that correct? Well, it would be actually more in the R&D stages all the way to commercialization at a certain well, level. So well, it would include well, manufa so the, the early manufacturing plants. Well, okay. In other words, the, the, the first manufacturing plant. No, there used to be a 30% ITC, and then, and then it was stripped. Uh, you know, the, I really urge you to, to, get, to get that 30% ITC. It would make it a lot easier to raise funds and, mm -hmm. and capitalize if the, if the investors had... Uh, had had less less at risk, so I, I salute your efforts, and, and I really hope you're 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 successful getting that uh, thirty percent ITC. If, if and if you could make it, uh, uh, so so that the funds are paid up up front, right. rather rather right. than have having to, to wait 
for them. You know, there, there used to be that right. th that program, and then it then it, it died. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, and for those who don't know, both the ITC, the investment tax credit, and the PTC, the production tax credit, are both short-term, highly politicized credits that come up for mostly wind and solar um, every year or two years and the rest. Um, the intent of this would be to be much longer term uh, and therefore depoliticize it and to work well with an ITC, PTC and how that works and making sure that everybody's incentivized and all the rest of it. We're still in the details of all that, that sort of stuff because we want to get the support of, uh, of those functions as well. But what we're really looking for is the innovation side. So, so if you look at solar and wind, those are pretty mature technologies now. And that would be fine for PTCs and ITCs, but, uh, but this would be at an earlier stage for new stuff. Um, question for Josh. Josh, you mentioned that a, a certain uh, unnamed VC uh, Ira Aaron Price had had, um, <laughs> had come up had come up blank for uh, success stories in, in clean tech. Can you give us a couple of examples of success stories in clean tech? It's a softball. It's a softball. It's a cream puff question that have have pro that have served customers, um, society, and shareholders. Sure, uh, Solozyme and Tesla. How about that? Good. Thank yeah, you. and and uh, MBA polymers. Yeah, MBA polymers as well. Yeah. I guess I would just add there's a pipeline of companies that are with strong growth sitting behind them that haven't necessarily gone public but are certainly changing the lives of a lot of people. Oh, power saving a gigawatt hour a day. That one up here, one back there, and then one up here. Adam. Hey, John. Uh, it sounds to me like a lot of the investments that you're all involved in fall more or less into the category perhaps of domestic or residential, IT related. But as you know, and I know, a lot of the energy being used, most of the energy being used is industrial, commercial in China. You know, there's the global issues of massive amounts of energy being used and will be used. I'm curious if you think the angel model, venture model, has much to say about that aspect of energy, less the Silicon Valley side. It, let me try first. So I, th I, think I, I think what I heard you say was uh, domestic versus international first, and then second, um, IT versus everything else in energy and clean tech. So, so on, on domestic versus international, it's really hard to, as I said earlier, you know, one of the success factors for us is, is being involved in a company. And when a company is more than 60 miles away, you can't drive there. You know, bu building a company is, 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 you know, in between in terms of complexity and time and resources and skill required, more complicated than building a house, less complicated than raising a family. And, you know, crises happen all the time. And you, if you've got to drive more than an hour, you can't do it. You can't participate. So for us, it's not true for, not true for my buddies over here, but for us, more than 60 miles away, forget it. Uh, just not going to work. I, I, I'm, I never mind that. So, so and then on the, on the IT space, everybody to the left of me, to the right of me, <laughs> right, uh, said that IT was important. But, you know, that isn't for us. So we, uh, so as I said, we made seven, seven investments last year, and I don't think that the information content was that high in at least four of them and maybe five. What was more important was, was, was having an, an unfair, sustainable advantage. And that's really difficult if you're not, make, if you're not writing software. You know, you have to have... It's hard to get that unfair advantage if you don't have some software in it, and so we look for that. Yeah, we look at our business as a startup. It's and and rule one of the rules of, of of starting a startup is to brutally prioritize, and and brutally prioritize on the right things. And so when we look at companies, while we would like to solve bigger problems outside of the U.S., perhaps it, it they're they're it's not really an option because A, we need to be with those companies and to surround those companies and, and to help those companies fill the gaps that they have, first identify those gaps, and then, and then, and then, and then bridge those gaps and fill those gaps. Number two is, is they're gonna need follow-on capital and, and therefore they, they're going to need to be incorporated in the US. Ideally, they're US facing. Um, and it makes it less difficult, but still difficult to get follow-on fi financing for them. Three is that the, the opportunity here to actually impact um, Think about 
energy efficiency and, and the commercial space. 40% of the consumption of, of, our, of our nation's energy is, is, is within the energy efficiency space in commercial buildings. Solve that problem and, and you're solving a big piece of, of, of the problem. So I've got two quick answers. One, we actually have a team in China and they're dramatically ramping up green tech investing in Asia. One of our partners actually is moving over there to help them do that and take sort of our green tech base and, and focus it there. Um, and then my second answer to that is we're actually, the U.S. is exporting technology to China. Um, you know, one of our companies that we are frankly really excited about in the U.S. that had corporate excitement around it. Uh, Great Point Energy, uh, China basically just invested in it and they're going to scale up the technology over there. So, um, you know, uh, <laughs> yes, distances and all those things can make it more complicated, but um, in more ways than one, uh, innovation is happening globally. And if I could just uh, add and take a different angle uh, on this. The, I think that um, uh, that we're in an era right now and one of the focuses on, you're seeing a very IT-centric talk uh, around all this, but that's the part of the cycle that we're in right now. And what that cycle is that we're reasonably capital light um, on looking at startups as well. Um, it would be really hard to get the billion dollar plus venture through my partnership uh, right now in this current, current environment that we're in. That doesn't mean that that's not going to change two years from now because it was too different than this two years ago, vastly different uh, and the like. But that's where we are today. Um, it's really important as entrepreneurs, for those who are, I saw a lot of hands go up about entrepreneurs in the audience, to just understand that, that the financing environment um, has as one of its criteria these days, capital light. Um, and, uh, and that means tens of millions of dollars to get to cash flow positive, not hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to get there. But stay tuned, because like I say, that, 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 that'll change over time. And therefore, the nature of the projects we work on is going to change over time as well. And with, inevitably, we will go back to energy generation, which tend to be the more capital intensive types of companies that we work with. Yeah, I had a follow-up question on that on grid integration of renewables, but let's go to the audience first. Yeah, uh, John Mashey, a uh, question for all of you, actually uh, follow on for that uh, about differences between the IT type startups and, and some of the other ones in, in, in terms of uh, working with big companies and how you manage the distribution chain support and all that sort of stuff. And then there's a specific one for Trey. Talk, talk some about Nest. You guys wanna? I, okay, so I guess I'll, I'll start uh, a little bit more on Nest. Um, you know, the, the, it was funny because when we originally um, started working with the team and, and I was sort of pitching this to my partners and to, to folks, they were, there was very much this, well, what's wrong with the thermostat? People, no one's going to buy an expensive thermostat. And my point that I kept pushing to folks was you can't take a VCR, connect it to the Internet and go, look at this great product when TiVo is right here, right? And, and so basically what people have been doing kind of in, in consumer efficiency is kind of stacking some new technology concepts on top of 40-year-old technology. And so what was clear to me is it was ripe for a platform change. Um, the beauty is you've got Apple, who's completely changed the mobile industry. Um, mobile phones um, are so explosive right now that that has, has essentially made this kind of technology affordable, doable. Uh, you know, if you took a part, and there is a great breakdown of the Nest thermostat, looks remarkably like an iPhone. Um, and it's because you need a team that understands all of that network connectivity, the cloud intelligence, all of that stuff, in order to create a consumer experience that today's consumers are going to come to expect from that kind of consumer product. So, um, so that's been a lot of fun um, to, to work with those guys. Was there a specific sort of insight or observation that you were looking uh, uh, to hear more about? Well, I, I think it was the general thing of how you got into it because yeah. thought their stats were born. Okay, so, so it actually it came from a couple different angles. Uh, one is, as you heard before, uh, what we do is really about investing in people. Um, and this particular team, Tony Fidel, is, is an industry legend in and of himself. Um, you know, he started iPod, grew the iPhone group under Jobs. And he's, he's one of those kinds of people you back no matter what he does, right? And, and so, so he came into our office uh, and, uh, you know, and said, I'm going to do this thing. And some of my partners were like, 
really? <laughs> and, and fortunately, there was me and some other partners who had actually been looking at this area and said, no, really. <laughs> this, is, this is exciting if we can get someone like Tony to focus on something as perceived and boring as a thermostat actually is. And that's the, that's the perfect sort of combination of things to create true disruption. So I could comment on the strategics element of it a little bit. Um, so the classical way in Silicon Valley to work is, is you stay away from strategics as long as you possibly can. And then when you have an overwhelming uh, advantage that they want to, they, they seek from you, then you've got somewhat of an even playing field and now you can get into a negotiation with them. And I think in the clean energy area, that's evolving quite a bit. First of all, I don't, I don't think that actually, that scenario ever was true. But uh, I think it's evolving even further than that. So uh, starting about, I'd say three or four years ago, um, it was very clear that for financial investors, they needed validation from strategics in order to create uh, a true presence for that startup and an endorsement for that startup in the form of partnerships uh, and the like. And this didn't mean, uh, for those of you who are uh, involved in life sciences at all, just racking up uh, a bunch of partnerships like old life sciences companies did and a bunch of uh, memorandums of understanding and things along those lines. These were really meaningful partnerships and people really looked at them as whether they would help assist the company to be, really become a presence and a real player in the marketplace. And that's true today. And it's true uh, with, uh, I'm sure, a bunch of our portfolio companies um, that we look for them uh, and their partnering activity to be a major milestone in their advancement uh, and the like. Um, the thing that I think is emerging now is, is that that's coming earlier and earlier in, in the process. Um, typically, that's been seen, strategics being involved, for example, near the founding of a, of a new corporation has been seen as a suffocating event that an entrepreneur wants no part of at all and, and all the rest of it. But the truth is we're going into an existing marketplace with huge incumbents um, who have specific agendas. And if you can uh, get to a point where you can understand those agendas then, and understand that, you, they're, that everybody's bringing something to the table, which is the startup brings off balance sheet development of whatever that product or service might be. The, the, uh, the uh, strategic brings the agenda plus potentially capital associated with that. Then you can see how a symbiosis can start to exist where everybody can live together um, pretty well. Whether we'll get there or not, I don't know. Um, but I, I see signs that we're, we're marching towards that. Uh, being the case. I don't, I don't know whether you agree or not. I, that well said. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, definitely. There's, I mean, these are huge ecosystems that have existed for a long time. So to be strategic um, and aggressive about partnering where appropriate makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. What I would say what I would agree with Josh, but just amplify that to say that what a strategic brings is, is, is customer validation. Mm -hmm. And you, oftentimes distribution, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. and distribution. Yeah, distribution, yeah, distribution customer yeah. validation. That's right. So now you know you know, this goes back to, is it real? You have some customer traction. I would agree. I would agree. I mean, one thing we do see, though, is that there is quite a bit of aggressiveness on the part of certain strategics now coming to startups at an early stage to begin to build relationships with them. And they're looking at these startups as incremental opportunities to bring in more customers and to add to their both top and bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so we're really focused on helping the startups navigate that world because it is complicated and it's not the same with every, with every strategic. Um, working with Intel is very different and versus perhaps working with a St. Cobain or a Google Ventures. Yep. Which isn't really a strategic, but most people <laughs> think of them as a strategic. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, actually, I was struck that both Larry and Bill Peary used this exact kind of built up the numbers to the three or four percent of sales uh, devoted to R and D in the energy space. That was Josh. It was Josh. Yeah. Um, it's three, actually three, three it's tenths, three four tenths, tenths of one percent. Three, three tenths yeah, of one percent. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So the the, the, the this is sort of a government uh, role in this. That's right. Um, so obviously you think a lot uh, more money should be put into maybe pre-competitive R&D in the energy, energy space? You mean from the government? Yeah. 
Uh, actually, uh, I don't think government does such a good job of direct investing in, uh, in startups. And I think we've gone through a little, uh, a few years of that and, uh, and the vagaries of it and all the rest of it are such that I'd much rather the government be involved in policy setting Help and demand, not exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yep. That's yeah. that's that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, I'd, I'd say uh, and research, funding research, funding basic yeah. research. Uh, we, we, that's probably where where the biggest holes are, especially in storage, for example. And uh, but on uh, uh, you know libertarian, you know, no mandates. Right. Got it. Got it. Yeah. On uh, so on the smart grid, you hear a lot about smart grid. Um, Jim Sweeney Center and others are doing these smart meter things, which so in California, it seems like that's, people are figuring out what to do with that. What's the next step in that? Do you go, once you go on the other side of the meter, is there a business model there that you've seen and like? Are you trying to find, saying, so this would be, to me, if you look at the big energy system transition we need, we need it's all about grid integration of renewables and other intermittent sources and so on. So yeah, the, maybe there's not enough of those to worry about it yet, but what, what, What's the next step in that evolution? Well, there's, there's getting the data, first of all. Right now, we're just outfitting you know, the, this, this old web of stuff so that we can actually get the data. But then we need an infrastructure to be able to hold that data, analyze that data, and then turn it into actionable information. And so you know, I'd say right now, we're in the very early, early innings of you know, no one's been able to access the data. It's been an entirely black box. So we're just now starting to get it exposed. And once it's exposed, and there's a true app ecosystem of like, I'm a homeowner or I'm a business owner and here's my data, then there's a lot of exciting stuff that can go on. But that data needs to be freed and delivered to folks in a secure way. And, you know, and there's a problem because utilities have never been built to be infrastructure companies. Um, and so you know, all of that makes for exciting new forward-looking opportunity. So who, who do you need? Is it state regulations, local stuff, company initiatives? I'll tell you what we really need <laughs> is to end the monopoly by the utilities. Yeah, we need competition. <laughs> uh, there needs to be, for those of you who, who may know the telecommunications history, there needs to be a Judge Green That's right. order. That's exactly okay? right. Yep. Um, <laughs> that would be a true game changer. So in, in, in the absence of that, at least for the near term, what we look at is the other side of the meter, is building management systems, um, for example. So you're dealing with enterprises and business to business, mm -hmm. and you're fundamentally unregulated. This is the, this is the innovation at the customer side. Yeah. Let, you know, build a great product that the customer can pull in and then force, force it back into the, the utility organization. Right. So work it from that, so. Yep. If right. you're counting on the, inst on the appliances on the customer side of the meter to, to, to be smart enough to send the data back, you're probably going to have to wait for all of them to be replaced. You know, you're looking at 20, 30 years for all of those to be, you know, in the manufacturers. So there we see it, about... It's actually pretty concentrated in just a few things, though, right? It, so. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, but so there, so there, we see about once a month somebody coming in with yeah. a data disaggregation. Yeah, right, you know. exactly. All right, and 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 so, so that on the other side, you know, there's an opportunity there, but, but there are so many companies doing it that, that none of them seem to be taking a big enough step, you know, to, to, to make a real dent. It will probably happen in the commercial and industrial space first. Well, I think one of the keys to it, and I think. Trey, you guys have done a great job of investing in, in this, the, the concept that you have to have something more than just energy savings. I mean, you can't just say to somebody, hey, I've got, you know. I'm going to sell you nothing. It. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're right. going to have less of something. <laughs> right, and your bill will go down and right, all right. the rest. It, it, that in and of itself is not going to create a big company. Um, Agreed, at the end of the day. absolutely. Yeah. It, it's got to be social interaction. It's got to be. It's got to make your life easier. Mm -hmm. In a business context, yeah. it's got to drive revenues. Okay, that's a really tough one. I've really challenged a lot of people. Is that how are you going to make that enterprise that you're addressing your problem to, you know, your solution to, you're going to make it more successful <laughs> the, the and grow? That, that's amazing to me is that there are great solutions out there that cut costs, and so I think part of what has to happen is just education and mm -hmm. standards and some trust being built and you know a great example and you know I, again I mentioned this company in lighted that's on a panel next you know it's lighting controls intelligent distributed lighting controls 65% energy savings on average in lighting right I mean it's a sub two year ROI it's 
these are kind of no-brainer things to do. The problem is you're selling to facilities. There's, you know, it's complicated. There's technology. And so these sorts of things take a little while to create change and trust. But, you know, we're right at the beginning of these new types of folks taking these new kinds of risks that ultimately, hopefully, we can help turn them into heroes instead of the last line of defense. Yeah, exactly. Great. On that note, unless there's any burning questions, I'd like to thank the panel for coming through. It was just a fascinating uh, tour de force. Thank you.